Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Australian National Maritime Museum and to tonight's virtual ocean talk, Seclusion at Sea, a discussion with three of Australia's world sailing superstars. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the Bamal and Badu, the lands and waters on which the museum is located. I'd like to pay my respects to them, their culture and elders past, present and emerging. And as a national museum, it is actually very important that we extend this acknowledgement to and respect to traditional custodians of lands and waters around Australia. So I warmly welcome you to this Ocean Talk webinar. It's a reimagining of a seminar series that we had planned for the Classic and Wooden Boat Festival. So while we're disappointed this couldn't go ahead due to COVID-19 restrictions, we're delighted to present some of our program in this webinar. So a huge thank you must go to our sponsor, Classic Boat Supplies from Belrose, New South Wales, for helping us develop these seminars, webinars. <laughs> so please check uh, the museum website for information on the webinars. There's a series of three related to classic and wooden boat festival themes over the, um, every Thursday in May. So check out the museum's website uh, to uh, register for these webinars. So tonight, we're going to talk with three Australian sailors who pushed themselves to elite achievement on the world's vast oceans. Solo sailor Kay Cotty AO, skipper Wendy Tuck, and navigator Adrian Carlin OAM. They have all sailed around the world, either alone or with a crew. They all happen to be women, a gendered in deep time prescribed a homemaker role. But not these gals, those days are long gone. Tonight we're going to explore how these sailors made their homes on the sea and tease out to what degree they felt at home in their small boats on the sea and how they lived or shared these tiny spaces, often in extreme seas and incredibly challenging conditions. So how did all three prepare for long haul voyages? How did they cope with the relative confinement and how did this experience change them? And significantly, how did they balance their inner and outer worlds? Something we all can think about in these COVID-19 times. So our special guests will take you into their worlds sequestered at sea. So let's start with some amazing footage from this intimate world on the ocean, an incredibly known yet unknown place. So let's move to the woman who took this incredible footage, Kay Cotty AO, joining us remotely from Yamba. Hello, Kay, how are you? Hi, Dana. <laughs> I'm well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Now, Kay made history in 1988 when she sailed her 37 foot, 12 metre uh, yacht, Blackmore's First Lady, back into Sydney Harbour after six months at sea. She became the first woman to sail solo, unassisted, non stop. Um, via both hemispheres around the globe. A pretty amazing achievement. Now, going around Cape Horn alone in the Southern Oceans may well be the ultimate in self-isolation. So welcome, Kay, and again, thank you for joining us. So let's start at the beginning then. Uh, what made you think of doing this in, in attempting to sail around the world solo? Uh, well, it started to enter my mind when I was a sailor, obviously, been sailing since I was a baby, and uh, I started shorthanded and solo sailing, and sailing around the world single-handed, non-stop, is the highest mountain you can climb in that sport. So um, I'd read about a woman called Naomi James who attempted to sail around solo non-stop, but she had to pull in for repairs and supplies, and that was... 10 years before I left. And so you thought, well, I can do this. So how Absolutely, did... yeah. <laughs> and what, uh, what, what solo sailing had you done beforehand? What, or shorthanded sailing? How much sailing? Um, 
Well, I started sailing my uh, VJ by myself on Crocker Bay where we lived um, when I was 10 or 11. And then my first sail on a yacht is a friend loaned me his yacht to sail from Lord Howe to Pitwater by myself. And uh, that was pretty scary. I was awake for the 60 hours of talk and uh, I was too scared to go to sleep at that time. But when I stepped off the boat, I, I just thought that's for me. I just loved it. You caught the bug. And then you, you built a boat, you fitted out, you built and strengthened a, a boat. Uh, tell us about that. Yes, I uh, used to build boats as a boat builder and also I had a yacht charter business. So I was used to building boats and repairing boats and things like that. So I got the Holland Deck with a yacht, uh, Laurie Davidson designed Cavalier 37 and I started from scratch and fitted it out. And um, that's what um, I got sponsorship then from Blackmore's Marcus Blackmore to do the two-handed race to New Zealand and single-handed race back in that boat. And then I thought I'd go for the round the world race, the BOC, but that, well, that's what I told my parents. <coughs> I was thinking of doing the BOC. So I was looking for a larger boat, but in actual fact, I was thinking of doing the non-stop. And, how, and so you largely built your own <coughs> boat. So tell us how you strengthened that boat, knowing that it was, would take a, a punishing uh, on the oceans. Well, when I couldn't get sponsorship to get a larger boat or build a larger boat, I decided to go in that one. And I knew she was pretty sturdy and I'd done a lot of miles in her. But I um, strengthened up under the mast, um, luckily, with lots of extra floors, which are ribs and frames. Um, Sometimes you fall off a wave, if it's not strong enough, the mask can crumple and smash what's down below. Um, I also strengthen up the back of the keel because when you hit something with the front of the keel, it tends to want to push the back of the keel up through the bottom of the boat. So I did a lot of strengthening around the keel. And uh, I built uh, two extra crash bulkheads in, up forward, and another one aft. And so you knew your boat, you built it yourself, and so you knew it, what it could withstand. So it's just you and your little boat out there. So how did you prepared your boat? How did you prepare yourself? Um, well, I thought I was pretty sane. My friends all thought I was crazy, obviously. Um, but they still kept saying, we think you should talk to someone. And I ended up talking to a sports psychologist and talking to him because I'd hallucinated once on a trip years ago and we talked about that and all the research in those days, and you're going back over 30 years now, Dana, all the research in those days suggested that people that hallucinate are either very, very lonely or very, very scared or a um, combination of both. And um, so we discussed about not if anybody comes on board, whether I'm convinced they're there or not, you just say get off and so um, it's telling that I never hallucinated on this voyage because I was so happy by myself and out there um, and the other thing was uh, so I didn't spin into a depression at any stage we came up with uh, happy thoughts make happy people and it's now been scientifically proven that your thoughts control your emotions and you can control your thoughts therefore happy thoughts really do make happy people um, I had to practice that a lot before I went, <clears throat> excuse me, and I didn't think it was going to work. Um, the first time I saw massive big waves rolling over to crash down on the boat, and I thought the boat would get crushed and roll over and sink. And then I thought I'd got to change my thoughts, and uh, lucky the sun was shining this particular day, and as the wave rolled up to crash down, and I was down below hanging on, looking through the companionway clear slides. And as the wave went up, the sun shone through the top of it. And I thought, well, not many people would get to see a sight like that from this angle. And how spectacular that was. <laughs> I was learning to change my thoughts. Oh, that's fantastic. So sorely tested, but well practiced. Yes. So in terms of supplies then, you knew um, you were you planned for, what, nine months at sea rather than six months in, in case? Oh, at least nine months, possibly a year. Yeah, in so case something got damaged, I was planning to make it my own way home under a jury rig or however I could. 
And the conditions of your record attempt were that you couldn't accept any external support, no help and no resources and certainly no fresh fruit and vegetables. So tell mm. us what you packed. Beyond your sailing gear, you obviously had a lot of sailing spares, but mm. risk management, very strong. But in terms of your emotional life and making that boat your home, what did you pack and what did you think you'd need for that time alone? Um, boy. <laughs> I do lots of things. Um, um, I took lots of wool for knitting and crochet. <laughs> I crocheted a couple of rugs. I knitted some beanies, jumpers. Um, I read, I took 60 books and I read them all. Um, no, sorry, I took 80 books and I read 60 of them, that's right. And um, I tried learning Spanish using the phone cassette, but that wasn't wasn't too flash and I took some sketching material because uh, I was interested in drawing and painting but it's funny to say you're out there by yourself but I'm um, actually ADHD I hate to admit it so I don't stop well I don't hate to admit it I mean it's what got me doing what I do and so I was always doing something fixing something um, Navigating, cooking, cleaning, doing the washing. You think of a normal day and then you've got to think about everything that you do in that day and then condense it all and add a whole lot of other things to it. So that makes a big difference. So tell us about a, a normal day, depending on the weather, of course. Tell us what you did every day. Um, oh, I didn't just go to sleep and wake up because <laughs> uh, you don't get that much sleep out there when you're by yourselves as uh, Adrian and Wendy would know. Um, I had to navigate. I'd, I'd try, when the weather was calm, I would try and put my sleeping patterns into um, 20 minutes at a time and I'd try and add up those 20 minutes to equal um, oh, I don't know, eight hours a day if I could. Um, in those days, 20 minutes is the time it usually takes a large ship to move from the horizon to your position and possibly run you down. So I did that. Um, the longest sleep I got was three hours and I only got that twice because I slept through the alarm. So the role of ritual, ritual was important and routine was important. Well, Try to. The one routine I did stick to, and I confess, and it wouldn't matter whether the boat was nearly upside down, I would sit down at five o'clock and pour myself a gin and tonic or whatever I was having to drink that day. And, uh, and it could be hailing and blowing 60 or 70 knots. I'd just make sure everything was fine for a little while and I'd sit down and... Mark the end of the day. But then, you know, you, it's no routine so to speak apart from just make sure you eat i always made sure i was dry when i could i mean i spent a lot of time so much time wet that my hands became um saturated and i couldn't work out why things were sticking to my hands and when i squeezed my hands really hard water ran out of them so it was quite gross really <laughs> so what was the scariest thing that happened and how did you cope with that that's our last question at the moment we'll pick up a lot of this discussion uh, later on in this webinar um, scariest time I think would have to be off the uh, coast of South Africa off the Cape of Good Hopes Cape of Storms and one night um, three things happened the boat got rolled over and I thought she was going to sink um, and then uh, I nearly got run down by a ship. Can you believe it? It would have been blowing. Well, my wind instruments blew out over 60 knots and I've since talked to ship captains and they said, and, and navigators and lots of sailors, and they said it was blowing over 100 knots and uh, the boat was surfing. The speedo broke when it got to 20 something knots and um, she was rolled over and pushed along in the wave and I was washed over the side and uh, then she straightened up, took off surfing again with me over the side 
So it was nearly losing my life three times in the space of one night, I think, that uh, was the scariest time. Mm. Okay, do we, I think we have to move on now, but that's, we're going to pick up a lot of these threads and how you um, coped and how those lessons you had prepared uh, enabled you to survive these incredible ordeals. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll talk to you again once we've spoken to Wendy and Adrian. Thank you, um, um, Kate. Yeah. So now, uh, Wendy, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Wendy Tuck is our next guest. Wendy is a skipper who has sailed around the world twice in the Clipper race uh, in 2015-16 and in 2017-18 when she actually won the race, becoming the first woman to skipper around the world race winner. The Clipper race sees skippers lead crews of amateur sailors in identical yachts across thousands of nautical miles of oceans in a number of legs over nearly a year. The route goes from the UK to South America, past the Cape of Good Hope, across the Southern Indian Ocean to Australia, north to China, east across the Pacific to North America, rounding it via the Panama Canal before returning to the UK. It does make one exhausted just saying it, let alone sailing it. So welcome, Wendy. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's great to be here. Mm, lovely. So can you, um, the Clipper race, obviously it's quite a punishing race. Can you describe your, um, what led you to enter the Clipper race and your sailing background to that time? When you actually um, won the race, you were the golden side of 50. So how does that happen? Um, I came sailing quite late. Um, I'd always surfed and my family had fishing boats and stuff, so I've always been on the ocean. But, um, uh, yeah, bought a boat when we lived in when I was married and we lived in Spain, taught ourselves to sail, then eventually came back to Australia. We split up and I hadn't sailed for a few years and thought oh, it would be nice to get back into sailing. I really did like it. Um, then that second time round, I just loved it. So I thought, how can I make a living out of sailing? Obviously, I was never going to be, you know, sought after to be on professional crew and stuff at my age by then. Uh, so I started teaching sailing and working in the marine industry and I'd been teaching and racing for a long time by then. Um, and I thought, well, I just need a bit of adventure. So I always like a bit of adventure. And I had a friend who'd previously skippered in the Clip Around the World race. And I thought, that's a pretty big adventure, sailing around the world as a skipper. So I thought I'd give it a go. So that's how I got there. And tell us about the Clipper race. How is it organised? Um, how are the crews organised? How do you prepare? Uh, it's it's a company, it is a, a, a business. It's run by Sir Robin Knox Johnson, the first man to sail solo nonstop around the world. Um, so he wanted to make a, a way for Joe Bloggs to sail around the world, you know. So people try out for it, they pay for it. They have four weeks of training, regardless of whether they've sailed or never sailed before. And how the team's allocated to you, so I don't get to choose my team, is it's graded, so, you know, we'll have... A's are really good sailors down to C's who might be novices. So they try to make the boats a mixture of A, B, C's. So you're not going to have one team with really good sailors and one team with people who've never sailed before. So that makes it part of the hard part of getting your team together as well. You might have people who are there who want to do really well and people who just want to get around the world safely. So you don't have a choice of your team, which makes it a bit more difficult. And um, tell us about your boat, Sanya Serenity Coast. How long is it? How, how, many, how many crew? How do you eat and sleep? How do you manage a number of people in that small space? Um, with great difficulty sometimes. Um, they're 70 foot, so in the Clipper Race now, there's 11 identical boats. They're all 70 feet with a single mast. Um, depending on the legs, so people can sign up to do the whole round the world race, or they might just do one leg. So your crew can vary from 18 up to 23. I'm on Sanya for some reason we were always really full people didn't want to get off they kept staying so most of the time we'd have 22 crew so a lot of people we'd run, I'd run a two watch system and then out of those two watches you'd have two one person from each watch would be on what we call mother duty where they'd be feeding the whole crew for the whole day and they'd, they'd have a full night's sleep that night and be back on duties tomorrow so it was a whole rotate you know roster system I ran the boat that I figured everyone's here to pay so they get a chance to do whatever they want to do on the boat, whether it was steering, trimming, sitting around doing nothing, you know. A lot of boats would run it that they only get their best steerers to steer, but we thought, you know, everyone should have a crack. So everybody did everything pretty much on the boat, which was made it enjoyable, 
sometimes a bit frustrating, but um, you know, it was good. It worked well. And you had a navigator? Did you have a, a volunteer uh, yes, navigator? Well. <laughs> Thank you, so, yeah. so I navigated, um, did everything. So from navigating to doing the watch systems, I had watch leaders. Um, halfway around the race, because of an incident, we then got a first mate on board. So that took a little bit of the pressure off. But the majority of the decisions were my decisions. I'd talk to the crew or the watch leaders and say, what would you do in this situation? But not tell them what I'd already thought we'd do, because I didn't want to sort of bias what they would come up and say. And it was always nice when they agreed with what I already thought we'd do anyhow. And if it wasn't, we'd talk about it a bit. Um, at the end of the day, it was always my decision, though. And so you... Did you have any yearnings? Like, you, what was your longest leg? And did you have any yearnings for another life while you were out there? I mean, how was it? Um, it's really funny. The longest leg was 35 days, which was the first leg, which was exceedingly tough. That was on the second race. It was the longest ever clipper race from Liverpool in the UK down to Uruguay, uh, Punta del Este. Um, so not only are you getting to know your crew, you're getting to know your boat, you're getting to know yourself again as well. Um, so that was quite tough, but we had a lot of fun on that leg. Um, yearnings for land, <laughs> I got in so much trouble from this. So I got asked by one of our media team on board the boat one day, what do you really miss from, about land? And I said, a flushing toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, my family weren't really happy. <laughs> so I guess you've just got to put yourself in that mindset. You're there, you can't change it. You know, you know it's only going to be 35 days or 30 days out of your life. So you've just got to go, it's just this short time out of the whole span of my life and just deal with it that way. And I also did that for the whole race. You know, the race goes for 11 months and instead of going, oh my God, I'm gonna sail around the world. This is so daunting. I just broke it down. Okay, I'm just gonna sail from Liverpool to Uruguay right now. And I just kept this one step at a time, basically, and keeping it in those small steps made it a lot, a lot less daunting. So you mentioned that you're the only professional crew member until the first mate came on board. So how was it managing crews of differing abilities and ages and life stages? I mean, um, how, how did you find that, given that you were largely thrown together? We spent a fair bit of time beforehand training, uh, getting to, trying to get to know each other, but it wasn't always possible because, you know, the training was always in the UK. Um, and some you might be training all your crew. So we'd have a meeting and before the race started with as many crew as possible. And I had a booklet with questions, you know, what's your, why are you doing this race for? What do you want to get out of it? So it was just trying to get all that together about, okay, you people up here who just want to win, win, win. And there's people down here who don't, we've got to try and bring that level here somewhere. There's always going to be that gap. It's amazing how if you do well, these people want to come up here. Um, so I was trying to find that how hard to push and what I think was pushing hard, some people might have thought was pushing really, really hard and other crew members might have thought it wasn't. So it was always just trying to find that balance and basically talking to your crew all the time. And did you ever have any mutinous crew members who, <laughs> who, who wouldn't take direction or, you know, play by the rules or sail uh, by the rules? 99.9% .9 of the time it was all fine, just one or two little incidents where... It became a real attack on me personally as a person as well. Um, but luckily for me, the rest of the crew were like, no, that's totally out of line. It's not the way it is. So there was one occasion um, and I was just lucky I had the backing of the rest of the crew who were saying, no, nah, we don't agree with anything that's just been said there. And I walked away and let them all talk about it. And, and I got all these anonymous notes and chocolates on my bunk saying, we don't agree with what he's just said. So please don't think that's from all of us. So. And that was tough, that was really tough because you try not to take it personally, but you do. You think, okay, this is just one person's opinion. Everyone's got a right to their opinion, but you try not to take it personally, but it is hard. And how do you um, find time for yourself? Is there is there an imaginative life, a personal life, given that you are racing, albeit with an amateur crew? Or is it all about speed and success, or is there time to um, relax on the, on the voyage? Um, it is hard because you are constantly thinking, have I made the right decision? Are we going the right way? Can we be going faster? Um, the way to take some of that off you is passing that on to your crew. Um, so then you do have a little bit of downtime. I had a couple of books on my iPad that I didn't really read. You'd start to read and fall asleep, which was good. Um, so there wasn't really any downtime. Um, not really. <laughs> not when you're on the water. So. 
I don't, yeah, not really. <laughs> not really, you, you're racing. You're racing and you're managing a crew. Um, so did the dynamic of the crew change over the, the period of the race, over the 11 months? Did everything gel? Yeah, we were like, from, besides that one incident, we were really lucky. We gelled straight from the beginning. And I think the difference between my first race and my second race was every stopover, I used to call them bags, wags and, and swags, the boyfriends, girlfriends and whatever, would come out and meet their partners instead of taking their partners who'd been away from them for, you know, 35 days or whatever, and they'd go off and spend alone time. They'd spend time with all of us as a, as a crew, you know, the bags, bags, they'd help do the, you know, clean the boat, do the life jacket checks, all that sort of stuff. So they were involved. So we just had this massive big team. So it wasn't just the people on the boat. It was their partners who felt like they were part of the boat as well and part of the team. And I think that was huge. And like, even now we have Zoom calls and they're all, talking to each other in the UK still so and which I think it was so nice you know you get into town and they'd already tell you where to go to get the best beer and pizza and stuff so it was great. So it really was it an extended family effort I suppose the crew became part of your family so just um, in terms of danger or excitement tell us about the most interesting or intriguing or exciting uh, leg or thing that happened to you on that boat in those big oceans. Um, the second race wasn't quite so bad as what the first race. In the first race, we had a knockdown in the North Pacific. We don't go around um, Cape Horn, unfortunately. But um, when we go across the North Pacific, it's horrendous. It's huge seas, it's front after front. Um, so we had a knockdown in the first race. Uh, someone got pinned, the whole pedestal and steering cage collapsed on someone. They got pinned under there, nearly drowned. We lost a life car, um, damaged, uh, damaged the deck. So I got knocked unconscious and had a gash in my head and broke a rib. So still having to wake up going, oh, this isn't right. That was pretty hard. And then that stayed with me for quite a while that, wow, that, it could have been so much worse. So I think, yeah, we're pretty lucky there. That was probably the worst. Funniest was having a conversation with a helicopter pilot trying to organise a date in Dublin, oh, sorry, in um, Derry, which never happened. So that's out in the middle of the ocean. The helicopter pilot just came past and started talking to us, which was hilarious. The role of communication is very important, isn't it? Like now, but when you're isolated at sea, compared to Kay's time, which you know you had one daily sh a sked, whereas you were you in constant communication with organisers and weather resources and. Yeah, we'd get weather files through once a day. Um, we had to send a blog off once a day. Um, other than that, we weren't on the phone or anything. If we were close by to other boats, we'd talk on the radio. Um, ships should have a chat with occasionally, especially if they were going to be in your way and you're asking them politely if they could alter course slightly. So communication is a lot easier now, so you don't feel quite as alone, alone out there as you would have in Kay's day for sure. So there's always someone at the end of the phone if you need them, which is really nice to know. All right. Well, well, thank you, Wendy. We'll pick up again a lot of these threads when we speak after we've um, spoken to our ne next guest. guest. Thank you. So uh, I'd now like to introduce um, Adrian Carlin, OAM, a 30-year veteran of global racing since her first round-the-world race in the Whitbread in 1993, a time she's been the only woman on board. As navigator, Adrian has spent many, many months at sea, in stints of 10 days on various interport legs to close to two months in a circumnavigation world speed record attempt. She's done a huge amount of seat of your pants racing with an impressive 28 Sydney to Hobart races, including six line honours, two overall winners and two race records to her credit. She has competed in several world record attempts, speed record attempts, and was watch leader on Nicorette when it broke the transatlantic record in 1997. One of her sailing, world sailing highlights was um, the speed record, the world speed record in 2004 on adventurer Steve Fawcett's super maxi trimaran Cheyenne in his quest to break the round the world record, which was then 64 days. Phew. So thank you, Adrian, for joining us tonight. Hi, Jane. And welcome. Thank you. Now, could you tell us about your sailing career, just how you got into ocean racing from the small boats and why you got into the big blue water events? Well, uh, I, I grew up on Sydney Harbour around the Lankove River, so I had a lot of neighbours and friends that sailed. 
and it was through them that I, um, our family, like um, Wendy and, and Kay, were, were water, I had an affinity with the water, and uh, so I started sailing dinghies in my late teens. But interestingly, what Kay said, Naomi James was also very much a, a hero of mine, um, and I started to devour these records around the world, Naomi James, um, Francis Chichester um, and the various races and uh, so whilst I was sailing dinghies I also um, developed a, an interest in navigation and yacht racing through the, the cruising yacht club and um, through different different um, harbour races and my first race was uh, Lord Howe Island in 1984 but um, when I went to the Sydney Hobart in 1984 which was my first race at the age of 20 uh, the crew of Lion New Zealand were there and they were about to do the round the world race and uh, that really sparked a, a, an interest for me. And from that time on, I, I think that was when I developed that dream to one day um, sail around the world. And, uh, and although I did get caught up a lot in the 18 footers and spent a lot of time, um, it was in about 1992, uh, I, I put a crew together for the, um, the, the Sydney Hobart race with a view to going on to the Whitbread. And I applied to a crew in 1993-94 race, and that's Frank US Women's Challenge. And uh, they said they didn't have a spot, but uh, I, they said, come over and try it anyway. So I said, OK, I'll do that. And, um, and I went over and I went over originally as a helms person and, uh, and, and turning my hand to rigging and everything, you know, because you've just got to do that. And uh, I ended up then navigating that race when their navigator um, decided that it wasn't for her. So, so that was great. So then I stepped into that navigation role and, and that's where it started and still goes on. Yeah, and you've sailed in a number of round the world races. Tell us about those. Well, um, the great thing is, you know, I'm very much, a, uh, I love teams. You know, I love being with different teams and there's, there's so many different types of round the world races. So I did the, the, the Everest of sort of the ocean racing world is, is the Whitbread, um, now Volvo Ocean, the ocean race. And um, so that was a fully crewed race of, of 12 people. And it's much more comforting to be at sea with a big group of people than on your own. I couldn't imagine that. And uh, so, uh, so I did that one, but there are also um, other variations. You know, the French do the Vendée Globe, which is on their own. There's the Barcelona race, which is just two people. And there's also the round the world record events, the Jules Verne, which, or the round the world record, which was a real goal of mine from the minute I did that round the world race. And so I looked at people like Peter Blake, Enza, they had done that, um, Olivia de Cursesson, and all the French scene. And what, one thing with Australia is that, you know, you, we, you look outside the world and so you tend to go overseas a lot, probably like when, Wendy did, and you just hung around out overseas in the French, you immersed yourself in all those places where yachties hang out throughout the world, the States, Europe, Spain, France, and you pick up on the buzz. And, uh, and so it was there that I made all those connections that then um, were able to, to get me into the, into the group where your name came up on the radar as a potential. So um, certainly after the Whitbread was, I mean, the Whitbread, we didn't have email or internet or anything like that. You know, it was very much a closed group. Uh, in terms of going around the world. So you made these incredible friendships that have, have, have come all the way through now. You're still racing with people who you were racing with or against um, back in the Whitbread in 93, 94. And so that then led on to, to joining crews like in the Admiral's Cup. The, um, the, uh, I, I tried to put a crew together for the 97, 98 Whitbread race. Uh, we sailed from London to Australia and then it, it fell apart there um, just financially. And then... Um, that was when I joined, uh, then I joined Tracy Edwards' team in 97, 98 as part of a, that t which was the start of my dream to do the round the world record. And that was with Ron Son Elias and Tracy Edwards. And she'd skippered Maiden in the Whitbread in, 93, in 89, 90. And uh, so being part of that team was incredible uh, as well. And so then I was on the scene. Um, I was a known navigator. And so then that's led me to Steve Fawcett's when they needed a navigator for the 2004 record attempt. Yeah, so you started out as a sailing groupie. Yeah. <laughs> well, very much so. No, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've all got these heroes and all these people that inspire us mm. and, you know, they fill us and uh, with the, the ideas on how to, to, to chase your dream. Yeah, so you succeeded then. You, went, you um, got a gig on Steve Fawcett's uh, Cheyenne yeah. and unfortunately, I mean, he subsequently died in, a, in another record attempt, in a ballooning attempt, but he yeah. had 
broken a huge number of sailing records, hadn't he? So what were the sort of terms and parameters for that? sailing attempt? So um, having done, uh, already done a, an attempt at the, that record in, in um, 1998 with Tracy Edwards where we got into day 43 and we dropped our rig. So that was with um, a team of 13 girls um, of, of various nationalities again. I had an idea of what was required, you know, in these type of races, uh, these type of record attempts. And uh, so when Steve rang me up, you know, I, I, having done a few round the world races uh, uh, in terms of navigation, I already had a fairly big body of knowledge about that that route, um, what was required electronics wise. I knew several of the people on board already. So Steve only gave me a couple. With these record attempts, you have to sort of be on standby for a long time. You know, you'll sit in the northern winter. So the course starts in the English Channel and then you go down around the four capes, so Cape of Good Hope, um, and, and then you, you start in the northern, um, yeah, off the, the channel, and the start line's between Land's End and Brest, and then you go the bay, through the Bay of Biscay, which we call the Bay of Certain Death, and then you go through there, across the equator, under Cape of Good Hope, under the two capes in Australia, New Zealand, around Cape Horn, and then back up. And so the, the best time to do it is, um, in the Southern Ocean summer, because then you've got long hours of daylight, um, then that you can, um, because particularly when you're sailing these high speed craft that are going 35 knots, you know, 20, 30, 35 knots, you know, the handling of them, you know, particularly in the night, is, is really quite, quite demanding. So if you, can, if you can have those long hours of daylight down there in the Southern Ocean, whereas Kay and Wendy would know, you know, the, the, the waves are, uh, you know, the sides of a tall building. So, you know, and particularly surfing them, you've got to be very careful, um, you know, because it's like taking off on a wave on a beach. So, um, you know, that's why you start, you sit in the UK in December and then and aim to go around through in those summer months and get back into the Northern Hemisphere um, be, before the summer when the wind runs out. So, so with the preparation, you know, we had everybody, uh, and, you know, I had a fully professional crew, which is very comforting. Um, and uh, so everybody knew their jobs. Everybody's highly specialised what they do with safety, food, for example, foods in six, you know, day bags of each day. You know, there's a rule, you never go into another day's food bag. Someone's in charge of that. And so the, the interesting thing was we didn't even... Um, and you start and the, the thing is that you go around and we, we had GPS then, so uh, uh, we have GPS now. I know people probably can't imagine the world without GPS, but um, so you, the interesting thing though is you don't see land. We didn't see land for 39 days. The first land we saw was Cape Horn. And, uh, but you knew it got hot when it was supposed to get hot and it got cold when it was supposed to get hot. And so um, it, it, was, it was interesting like that. But, for example, we didn't have any... You don't have any creature comforts, you know, I don't think... I can't even recall if we had books. I know Steve read a lot, but... Um, and, and what you really want for is a, a warm bed, you know, when you get an eight hours sleep, you know, you, these things you take for granted on land are, are, and a long night is fantastic. And yeah. describe that, it's a bare bones racing machine, so describe that boat. Well, underneath, I mean, you have just... How long is it for it, start? Well, the, the actual, the, the one when we did chains, it was about the size of a tennis court, if you can imagine sailing a tennis court around. And it was like on, it was on matchsticks. It felt like you were kind of crawling your way because, uh, because it's not like a solid monohull, so um, and it's very jerky. You had to be make sure you were clipped on all the time because if if you ran across the nets and a wave got you and it stopped, you'd get you were going 30 knots, which was like 60 kilometres in a car. So if you weren't clipped on, you'd smash against a beam. So you know you were very conscious about that. We had uh, watches. Um, as a navigator, I'm normally on any, any type of ocean race around the world. I'm separate from the watchers. So in terms of isolation and being in a group of people, I'm actually quite lucky because I have my own space. So I can sort of be a bit separate from the crew and uh, and also my own. I do my own timing. So um, interesting listening to Kay talking about the 20 minutes and things like that, uh, particularly, for example, in that round the world race, I used to keep a sleep log because otherwise I couldn't remember when I last slept. So, when you're on a watch, it's easier because you're up and down, you know, um, and that in theory isn't always the case because things happen, so watches get called up. But, but so I'd keep, so that I knew that I was getting enough sleep because certainly in my job, lack of sleep 
translates into poor decision making. So I've got to really work that well. And um, you know, in terms of the food, we just have freeze dried food. So you just pour hot water into it. And, uh, and so we didn't chew anything for 60 days pretty much. <laughs> so there's, there's not a, a hundred grams out of place in those no, bones because no, speed every, is of the essence. Speed is of the essence. And um, although you're in this little bubble going around the world, you know, um, you don't feel isolated. You feel, you, you're so focused on what you're doing because you, the thing that and, and in any ocean racing, you don't want to lose, and particularly in a record attempt, you don't want to lose by a second. So, you know, that keeps you just so focused about what you're doing. And, um, and you know, because you're racing, you know, you've always got an obligation. You've got um, to talk to the team. You've, you've, you've got so much going on. And then when, when you don't have something going on, that was when I, I sort of try to duck off and sleep. So if the weather's not going to change, I'll, I'll disappear. But, um, and just put my head down. So, you know, you, you, the time goes so quickly at sea. You know, I, I find I find that it, um, you know, you're gone and then you're back before you know it. And um, were the winds and the seas always demanding or was there time to like smell the roses, watch the whales or did you just go the whole time? Oh, I mean, no. I know you're going because you, it's yeah. a speed record attempt, but was it quieter at times? Oh, uh, yeah, no, very much so. I mean, I, I always like to take a minute to, to just put my head on deck and look around and, mm. and take in the moment. You know, there's so many beautiful moments and, you know, I love the trade winds. The trade winds are my thing. I love the sun and the clouds and, you know, the little clouds and the beautiful little white caps on the ocean as you breeze through the trade winds. But the Southern Ocean too, you know, it's quite frightening, And but um, but at the same time, it's magnificent. You know, uh, the, uh, the Albert, seeing the albatross, you know, and the wingspan is, is really something special. And uh, just the remoteness, knowing where you are, that you're so far away from the rest of the world. And it, it's funny because the, one of the French guys on board always used to say, he'd done, he, he's done like 10 around the world. And he used to say one of his saddest moments was actually finishing because he loved just being at sea. And you love being at sea. I love being at sea and I love being on land. So you know, <laughs> you know you're at sea though, even though you're in this almost pure racing machine and you're yeah. down below a lot of the time. Yeah. As you said, you come up and you look. So how do you, how does it, could you be anywhere else or you know you're at sea? Uh, yeah, look, the, the wonderful thing, there's so much at sea that's, that's well, it, you know, you don't have all the pressures of life. You don't have the phone ringing. You don't uh, have, you've got other pressures, but, you know, there's no, for example, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you don't have a shower at sea and things like that, but you're, but you're getting waves and the air's beautifully clean. So you don't have any pollution. You know, um, there's, it, it, life's quite pure and quite simple. And the sounds of the sea and the sounds and that's of the wind. And the beautiful wind. sounds yeah. of the sea. And particularly with the multi-hull too, when we were on Cheyennes, it used to hum. So you, you knew the sound of how where how fast you were going. So when I was in a bunk, you'd, it was almost like, and I'm sure, I know Wendy and Kay will know exactly what I'm talking about here, how the sound of the sea on the boat tells you what the boat's doing. And you, you so become so attuned to the motion, to the sound, the sound of the, the wind through the rigging on the appendages, that you, you know what the boat does. With, without having to look on deck sometimes. That's absolutely beautiful, isn't yeah. it? It sounds beautiful. I mean, very much hard work, very hard work and not enough sleep. Um, look, uh, yeah, look, you, there's no doubt you've got this level of fatigue that mm. is there and, you know, that, that, you know, often after the Hobart, you know, it's like a form of jet lag. You'll, you'll race for a couple of days and then sleep it off, you know, the, because of, of that, that ongoing fatigue and worry and, and, and pressure. But, you know, the, I know, too, when I speak of isolation on board, when I, particularly those round-the-world races, I wasn't married, I didn't have children, you know, I didn't have those outside responsibilities. So I was really quite carefree in terms of it being an adventure. You know, the, there were guys on board who had children. I know they desperately missed their children in those two months out at sea. So that sense of isolation for them was probably quite acute, whereas I, I missed my... my my fam, my own immediate family, but not in the same way that I, I would mm. miss a child. I think, mm. you know. And uh, I know one, the Spanish guy had one of his children's teddy bears on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a? Can you take a special thing on those? Oh um, yes, racing? yes, 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 yes. No, you, you, you can take something special with that. You know, whether, whether you're. 
of one who takes the St. Christopher for metal like I do, or, you know, there's all those little, we're very superstitious bunch of sailors. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we might open up our discussion talking about special things. Uh, Kay, you had a, a few special things on board. I mean, you, your situation is really quite different because your world was your boat and that was six to nine months and it was your nest. So what special things did you take or during the voyage? Oh, can you open your mic, Kay? We can't hear you, yeah. sorry. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, that was me. Um, I wasn't racing, as you all know, so uh, I took a lot of special things, but the funniest thing that my friends thought I took was I took a teddy bear. I actually, I took lots of teddies because they were given to me different versions, but the teddy bear that I took was almost life-size. It was huge, <laughs> and uh, that caused no end of mirth. As you can imagine, it's uh, in the museum at the moment. I think you, you've borrowed it. I gave it to my son when he was little. And it's life-size. And in fact, I, I make a little joke sometimes and say you didn't really sail around the world on your own because you had Ted there. So you used to talk to Ted at times, a, a way of companionship, and write poems. Oh, yeah. Yes, I talk to Ted and swear at Ted and everything else. But you do tend to talk to yourself. I find myself when I'm working on my boat now, I talk to myself but I've done a fair bit of sailing since crossing a few oceans on big boats with crew and I can really relate to Wendy and Adrian talking about the different crew and balancing feeling and and bouncing off the crew and uh, I found that fascinating and I'm still I'm still doing that occasionally crossing when a friend's got a boat crossing the ocean I always put my hand up and Wendy, just on this special thing, this emotional need or a comfort thing, what was your comfort item when you raced, sailed around the world? Um, I didn't really have too much the first time, just photos of the family um, and cruise dogs. I had photos of cruise dogs in my nap station. So they were uh, down looking at a, a dog will make you smile quite a lot. Um, second time, Sean the sheep. I've got a little sheep I take. Um, that's probably about it, I think. So mainly photos, mainly for me. And, you know, I have a few little medallions that are sentimental and, and I think bring me luck. And have um, any of you um, been at sea, I know, Kay, you have, during special days like Christmas or your birthday or your mother or father's birthday? And how does, how does that unfold? How does the emotion of that day unfold when you are alone at sea or in a group at sea? Okay, perhaps you first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I had both my birthday and Christmas at sea. Um, and it was fine. Um, my birthday, I baked myself a big giant chocolate cake and I didn't have to share it. Um, at Christmas, I had a big bag of presents to open from my family and friends, which was pretty exciting. And um, I took decorations, but I couldn't find them, so I drew some stupid Christmas trees and things and stuck them around and um, I had a great day. I did get through on the radio and talk to my family. And say one day, one time a day, you had a daily sked, didn't you, where you spoke to people, is that right? Uh, that was depending on the weather, really, and the ice, oh, ice sonic <laughs> <laughs> conditions. Um, Sometimes I couldn't get through at all the days. And uh, that was scary for my family because they didn't know. And my mother used to talk to me a lot on the radio when she could get through or when I could get through to them. And uh, I used to get frustrated because she'd flatten my batteries. But I realised why afterwards was because when we said over and out, she never knew if she was ever going to hear from me again. So. Once I realised that, I'd let it rate on a bit. Oh. And Wendy, Wendy, were you? Do you have any rituals associated with special days at sea? Um, no, not really. Just um, a phone call to the family. But I hate talking on the phone at the best of times. So a phone call to the family. Um, if it was someone's birthday, we'd always have cakes and stuff and try and make them feel special. But 
that's about it. So I've never had a Christmas at sea, luckily. Well, I think it'd be quite special, actually. Um, so, yeah, just cake and phone calls. And Adrian? Yes, I think like Wendy, I think the team, we must be all a bit more pedestrian about these events. You know, well, we don't, like I haven't had Christmas, obviously Boxing Day is a big day. I've only had one birthday at sea. That was the start of the Whitbread in 93, 94. And, uh, you know, I, I, I am a bit prone to seasickness. So I think someone put a cake on board, but I was in no, no position to, to eat that, having just gone out into the channel. But uh, yeah, look, uh, we, we always celebrate and acknowledge everyone's birthdays and, and something special, it's always nice something to chat about, particularly the younger ones, you know, um, you always want to keep them, you know, it, it, people are, are very private, I find, you know, at sea, you know, the, there's not many people often who, who wear their heart in their sleeves, so some people don't even tell you when it's their birthday. Mm. So it's the well-oiled machine, so they hold that in yep, and do right. their job. Yeah, mm. very much so. And uh, so being at sea, I mean, is there something you learnt about yourself on those long voyages? that's helped you through life? Oh, look, I think definitely um, when, you, when you go out, it, particularly leave Australia and you're young and, you know, the world's your oyster and you're quite, you know, uh, full of uh, all this energy, it, certainly learning the subtleties that come from um, diplomacy is one of the biggest things you learn, particularly in a team environment. Learning to be more sensitive to other people's needs, needs on the boat, um, particularly uh, in terms of people who don't speak English as a first language, uh, to be more considerate, to talk more slowly, and just to, to see the two sides of everything. I think that's a really important thing to see, try and understand the other person's point of view and that your way is not always the right way. And Wendy? Yeah. Everything that Adrian said, absolutely true, especially with me. I've had so many different nationalities and and I'm quite quick anyhow. I talk fast and I want things to happen fast and it's trying to slow down. But one of the biggest things I learned between the first race I did and the second race I did and which I take through life now is be kind to yourself. I know everyone's throwing that word around now, but I've been using that for quite a while now that... When you're out there, you make a decision, and Adrian has probably done this, you make a decision and you go, oh, my God, I think it's the wrong decision. If it does prove to be the wrong decision, it's harder to say, okay, I did make a bad call, brush it off, get on with it and carry on and try and let it fall off you and start again. And the only way to do that is by saying, yeah, I pretty much stuffed that one up, didn't I? But it's okay, I'm human, move on. And that's one of the biggest things I learned between the two different races. Yes, it's often how you... Re Mistakes are not so bad, but it's how you recover from those mistakes, I suppose, isn't it? That's the lesson from that, how you deal with it. Now, Kay, what about you? What did you learn about yourself on that long, deep haul, ocean haul? Oh, I learned that my opinion is always right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my husband and son still say that's the way it is today. Um, no, I learned, uh, surprisingly enough, I learned a lot of patience because there's not much you can do about the weather and there's not much you can do. Well, I had to fix if something broke, but I I came back a lot more, uh, a lot calmer and more serene because um, I started sailing on a 37 foot boat and I, to me, I finished the voyage on an ocean and it made me realize how insignificant we are. And I just became much more calmer. And uh, I think sailing with a crew, as Adrian and, and Wendy have done, would be a hugely different thing. Having done that now several times, I just, a few years ago, I did the ARC race with a mate and, and there were about five nationalities on board. It was with Marcus Blackmore, actually. There was Marcus and myself and Biff, who taught me to navigate, John Biffin, and us three old mates had an absolute riot of a time with a fully paid international young crew. <laughs> and we all did our watches and things. But And then I helped deliver a couple of boats across oceans with big, big boats with crew. And I don't know that, and I wasn't skipper, in either one of any of the trips that I did, but I don't 
I would do things differently to how they would have done it, but I didn't pipe up and say, oh, I don't think I'd do it that way or something like that. So I learned a lot of restraint sailing with crew. And do, do you think there are any um, or lessons or things we can take away from a life on the ocean in a small boat and transport those to our lives in COVID times, you know, with physical distancing and being sometimes caught up in quite small households or small apartments with large numbers of people. Is there one takeaway you can offer people? Um, I think uh, don't get too introspective. Uh, there's still lots to look out on, especially in this day and age of the communications that we've got, the computers, the, the TVs and the phones and everything like that. And if you are alone, you start to learn something or do something like that. I mean, there's so much that you can do if you haven't got the um, the means. There's so many things you can do by yourself. Or you can talk to other people that are in the same sorts of situations and there's lots of phone lines that you can get onto and talk to people and help yourself as long as you don't get too introspective. And just work on improving yourself or helping someone else to improve their life. And Wendy and Adrian, anything, any suggestions for, for life in COVID? Um, I think, sorry if I just jumped in there. I think um, like people are suffering differently. I think the important thing is to think everyone's reality is your own reality. You know, you don't know what someone else has gone through. So you might think, well, it's been pretty cool for me. I've been, you know, not working much catching up on reading and study and, and friends overseas, but other people mightn't have that reality. They might be finding it tough. So it's hard, you can't judge how you're dealing with something by how everyone else is dealing with something because you don't, they might never have to be in a load or self-resilient before. So I just think, yeah, don't, you know, just everyone's reality is different. So don't judge how you're dealing with something to how everyone else should be dealing with it. Adrian, any tips? Oh, well, I guess one thing when you're on the ocean, um, you really just deal in your immediate surroundings because everything else is, at, is, way, is just the horizon. So I think to just, if you can, and f try and find some joy in your immediate surroundings and maybe the, or the, the people around you, see the, the good things, time to f uh, try and find a happy time. And, uh, and, and remember that the isolation will end, so try and do all those jobs you said you'd do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get them boat. done. <laughs> Ma maintain your boat. Yes. Maintain, keep your house in order. Yeah, read, I, read that book on weather you always said you would. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you. It's been a, a fascinating conversation. I know we could keep going all night, but we can't at the moment. So really, thank, um, I'd like to thank you all three, your sailing superstars, Kay Cotty AO, Wendy Tuck and Adrian Carlin. OAM. Thank, thank you, you very much for joining us this evening. Now, I'd like to thank everyone at home for joining us this evening and, um, and I hope you really enjoyed the evening as much as I did. Um, a huge thank you again to our speakers and a thank you to our sponsor, Classic Boat Supplies of Belrose, New South Wales, who continually provide Australia's wooden boat owners and builders with products to keep their boats authentic and beautiful. So thank you very much to our sponsor. We wouldn't be here without you. Our next station talk is Famous Racing Yachts Restricted 21 Foot Class. So you can register online at the museum's website um, for next Thursday, the 28th of May, uh, 2020. Thank you again for joining us. Can I talk? <laughs>